Welcome to the Landscaping Podcast. My name is Joel Barnett and I'm your host. And today is another Instagram Live Q&A. Got, uh, how many questions I've been counting? How many questions we've got? Two, four, six, eight, ten. Fifteen questions today. So uh, there's a couple of good ones in here too, like really thought-provoking ones. Uh, the first question is from Megan, who's a, a current client of mine. Uh, if you ever did stop for lunch or smoker, what would be your favorite food? So I'd, uh, anyone who, whose project I've worked on would know I don't stop it. I don't like eating anything while I'm working. Um, but uh, dare espresso, dare iced coffee, double espresso would be one of my weaknesses. Um, so I don't know if that, that might come out again at the garden show during the build just to keep the uh, energy going. Um, but I do the the fasting method. I don't know what it's called, but um, but yeah, I'm happy not eating during the day and don't need any for energy. So I just drink plenty of water and find that's enough for me. So uh, anything I eat during the day, just sits in your stomach and feel like crap for the rest of the day. So happier, happier not eating. Uh, Cam from Abcam Horticulture, Abcam Horticulture said, what was the motivation to start the podcast? Did you think it would get so popular? Oh, thank you, Cam. Um it's interesting. I didn't have that much thoughts about it, which is probably a good thing before starting. Like I didn't, I wasn't bothered how many people listened to it or um, I didn't put a lot of thought into it about the reasons why other than I wanted to talk to people, uh, particular people within the industry. So Graham Rowe was my first guest I had on because I wanted to hear his story because um, every time I spoke to him, he was a pretty cool guy and wanted to know more about it. Like he loved his plants and he's a huge plant nerd. So I wanted to talk more about him and then maybe realise I'd like to hear other people's stories and I didn't want to have to suggest that to an existing podcast because there aren't that many landscaping ones anyway. So that was the motivation behind starting the podcast and then it's just, um, well, there he is. Graham's already on. Uh, and the, um, then it just grew from there. So I just, that, after I did that first bunch in New South Wales, I just loved it and, you know, if I could have done that, if I could do podcasting full-time, I would. Um, but... It doesn't doesn't quite pay all that well at the moment. Get a few mil, few million more views that could change, but we'll, I'm happy happy doing it for the passion, which is what I do landscape for as, as well. Um, do I think it will get so popular? It's um, it's interesting because I'm coming from you know spending a lot of time on Instagram looking at those type of numbers. That's like one of my reels uh, for the second time just recently got a million views, which is mind boggling. Because I've got um, when I posted, I had twelve thousand followers. Um, but podcasts are a lot lower numbers, but uh, there's a metric they use to measure them, which is the amount of uh, downloads in the first seven days. And where this podcast is sitting at is around the uh, I think it's sixteen percent uh, of all of like podcasts worldwide in the top sixteen percent, which is pretty crazy how high that is. But I think it's more because a lot of people have a podcast. So there's a lot more getting less views as opposed to not many getting more, if that makes sense. So that, cause you know, everyone's got a podcast these days. So, and there's a podcast about every, every type of subject you could think of. So I think it's more about a lot getting less views more so than this one getting a lot. Um, but yeah, but it's all pretty awesome seeing how far it reaches and everything. Um, but yeah, to the popularity, it doesn't like I love the numbers. I look, I got because I'm a numbers nerd, so I like looking at the numbers. But it doesn't bother me what they do. I'm just curious about them. So, um, didn't I didn't think it would get as popular as it has because I didn't think about the popularity of it. Which is a bit of a yeah generic boring answer, but that's that's the one it is. I grow Mark from Grossman Coaching said, if you had to check out tomorrow, what's your best piece of advice you could leave for another landscaper? And I assume by check out, he means die, which I don't plan on doing, but you never know. Um, but it would be, my advice would be not so much just for a landscape, but for anyone is just be a good person. That's what I tell my kids to do. I do always, I'm always telling them that good, thing happens, good things happen to good people. Um, and yeah, the the older I get, the more um, thoughtful I get about things like that. And it's amazing when you when you sit back and think, and look at the way life happens for some people that um, yeah, good things seem, seem to happen to good people. They also have bad things happen to them as well. So don't get me wrong, but, um, but yeah, just, just being positive and 
Mark, who asked that question, is certainly appears to be one of those people. So uh, he's certainly living that mantra. Uh, Cascade Landscapes said, what's a power tool you wish you bought earlier? Uh, there was a few. I was thinking of this beforehand, and now they've gone blank. But uh, there was actually, yeah, it was the impact driver. So when me and uh, my apprentice Dave were building our first show garden back in 2011, so 12 years ago, we were... Uh, we would, I didn't have an impact driver at the time, so I'd only been running the business for two years for myself. And as an employee, we never had one. So I was just using the normal, you know, Makita drill. I don't even know what you call them. Yeah, don't know what they call them, but it's not the impact driver, it's the other one. So we would pre-drill with that and then put a, put a screw head in there as well and screw in with that. And sometimes the screw wouldn't go in properly, so you'd have to go in a little bit and then reverse it back out and then go in a bit again. Now, I could hear a lot all this rattling going on at the garden show. I think, oh, these guys have got some fancy drill. So, yeah, that's one of those things you don't necessarily learn everything, but then you, but you just make things up as you go. And, yeah, I learned that there's such a thing as an impact driver for your drill. You can buy them in kits. Um, and now I've got four of them and probably two two as well that are broken that are sitting at the shed. So, yeah, we should bought one of them earlier. That would have been handy and build, a lot, build things a lot quicker. Um, I've always had a laser level, even though when I start, studied... Uh, horticulture we learned how to do things with a dumpy level so that was that was helpful i've never had one of them uh, there was something else i was going to say uh, for a tool oh the corking gun the we've got a, a makita battery operated corking gun which is amazing i just the other day i was corking underneath a um a swimming pool uh coping and because the pool was filled i didn't want to use the battery operated one because it would have got wet so i was using the old school corking gun and yeah it just reminded me how good the battery operated one is it's amazing how quick you can get through things with it. Uh, very Clint, so Clint Adams has asked, how much money would you want to stop podcasting? So Clint, I uh, went out for tea with him the other night, actually. That was pretty cool catching up with him. He's from South Australia, and he's he runs the Full Landscape podcast. So I was a guest on that, and he, he's been a guest on mine as well. So that was the first landscaping podcast that I came across, actually. Probably, that might have been, I don't know if it was 2018. But I did. A, I gave him a review on his podcast, so it's sitting on there. So that'll, that'll date how when it started. But um, but yeah, he's a very competitive human. Uh, he, he's a lot more of an entrepreneur than not what I am. So he's um, yeah, very competitive in that regard as well. So he's wanting to. So when he's wanting to have more podcast episodes than what I've got. So when I was on his, well, when we were on each other's podcast at that time, he had more than mine. Well, I'm at two. And then he stopped for eight months and and now I've started doing two a week. So I've um, gone past him and, yeah, there's no way he can't come back. Not a chance. I'm just going to see. There's a different thing on the live. There's a little question box here. Ah, oh, it's like the, it's like the questions don't show up in the, in the feed anymore. So I better answer it just in case I don't see it again. So Lloyd Sharp has asked, what has been the hardest time in your business life cycle? Stress about too much work or stress about no work? Uh, easily would be the stress about cash flow. So um, never, I've never had stress about no work. There was a period that uh, we laugh about now. So Zocker, who's been with me for uh, seven and a half years, in the first, so he started in August, and that um, the Chris, like the December of that year. I didn't have any work for him, which is a wild time, wild thing to think about because, you know, everyone wants things done so quickly at that time of year and I didn't have any work. So, so that was in 2000 and, uh, what would that be? 15. So that's when I just started the business again, the second time. Um, so yeah, I was thinking, you know, what kind of joker am I if I don't have work in December? Um, so that's the only time I've ever not had work, but I wasn't stressed about it because we had jobs that were going to start in January. I just didn't have any little one to fill in for like, it was like two weeks. So I was just able to get it, uh, farm him off to a, uh, to Kurt from Urban Elements. So another landscaper I knew. So he, he was working for him and getting paid by him. So it wasn't a big issue, but never had an issue without, uh, without work. But I've mentioned it a couple of times that, that I'll, it's it's hard. It's easier to say what you're currently experiencing is more stressful than anything else because it's kind of like a recency bias. But um, when you've got no work, you can call in favors from a million other landscapers around you who will probably be able to give you work. 
or you can just relax and take some time off. But if you've got too much work, you've got to get that work done. So there's no, like you can't really call other people in because they're probably flat out as well. But even st- even still, the client has picked you to do the job, so they would want you doing it. Um, so that's that's always the hard thing is getting too much work and saying yes to too many people. Um, so, I'll, so I've got into a good habit recently of um, like I won't book any work in for to, like the last six weeks of the year because other jobs might push back. Um, so it's just good to leave that time free. And then if you're going to finish a few weeks, a couple of weeks before Christmas, and then that's not the end of the world either. You can either start back earlier or or help out another landscape that they need to chop out. So, you know, so not having work is a good thing because you can change that quite easily. But if you've got a lot of work in, then that's, yeah, it can be quite stressful. Um, but luckily I've, I've started to, you know, I don't stress about much anymore. But the cash flow thing is the the biggest issue, the biggest stress for me. Um, doing a garden show didn't, doesn't help that at all, I can tell you. But luckily we've got a couple of good jobs on the moment. So um, we're able to hit a couple of milestones in them so that we can get the, uh, send the invoices out. But yeah, that's, that's probably been the only stressful thing is, is managing that. And then the bigger job, the bigger the jobs get, the harder I find it is because you're having to spend a lot more money. So it's, uh, yeah, percentages are the same, but you're just spending a lot more money. So it's, it'd be, if the, if I had like a, an unlimited amount, I can, you know, go into like a debt for, and then pay it back at the end of the job, that would be fine. I wouldn't be bothered by that, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's been the only stress. And the only other stress I've had before that is when I, at the end of the, of the first time I was running the business, which was the catalyst to make me get out of landscaping part-time to go work at the bank. When uh, we had a client who didn't pay a deposit because I didn't send a deposit invoice and we had heaps of work booked in. Uh, We were knocking heaps of work back because we had this big job booked in and then he pulled out really late and it was in the middle of winter. So um, so there wasn't a lot of work and I was freaking out thinking we're not going to be able to do any work, but then I did find more work. Like I, like I've just said before, you'll be able to do, but that scared me enough to not be, want to be self-employed. So then I worked at the, went and worked at the bank, but yeah, so there's plenty of, a lot of stresses in business. And luckily I'm not someone who gets that stressed. Like I'm pretty, um, pretty laid back in that regard. So It'd be a lot harder for people who do stress out a lot of things and worry about, you know, the little things. But I think you get less and less of that as you get more experience in business as, as you get older. You realise nothing's as bad as it seems and nothing's as good as it seems. Um, but yeah, that is a good question. Once again, from Lloyd, who's always a, always good to get those ones in. Um, next one is from Greenco Landscapes. Do you think a National Landscape Association is a good idea? I think it's yeah, it's a great question because I think it is a good idea, but there's also there's you know pros and cons to it. So I think it's good for Australia because the to be able to um, uh, have things similar in each state. So at the moment, like getting your building license is different in every state and territory, just about. So it's a lot harder to get it in some places than it is others. So then, if you're going to work in a different state. You would, you'd have to get it again. Like people in Queensland, I think I think Queensland seems like the easiest to get it as far as I'm aware. Uh, and Melbourne is certainly a lot harder or Victoria is a lot harder. So if you come from Queensland and you've got the, um, whatever the equivalent is of your building license for landscaping, you still have to reapply for it in Victoria. And that wasn't the case. So people were going to Queensland and getting it quite easily and then coming to Victoria. So they would already have it. So it'd be good in that regard if things were a lot more uniform across the different states and territories. But it's also important because that the, the, there are, like if, if there was only a National Landscape Association, I would be pushing for state landscape associations like there are now because every state and territory have got their different needs. And there's, so there's different, you know, different things that that they need to look after and need to work on. Like if you think about the size of Australia, it's no it's no surprise because if it, it's similar size or similar size to Europe, so yeah, Italy and Germany don't care what each other are doing in terms of their landscaping, so they just need to focus on each other. 
So I think, yeah, that it's it's important to have the state organisations, but there's also there'd be positive things about a national one as well to be able to have things more more uniform across the different states. But whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. I, I think it would be a good thing, but I'm sure there's someone who's got examples when it, where it wouldn't be good to have them all the same because there's different you know, quirks in different states. Uh, Jake Simo has got a question. What made you go from banking to landscaping and how did you do it and who was your inspiration? Well, I went from landscaping to banking and then back to landscaping. So uh, I, I liked at the time I was calling it a rever- reverse Win Stanley because Bruce Win Stanley, uh, he who's an icon of the of the industry in Victoria, he started in banking and then went into landscaping. And I started in landscaping and then went into banking. Um, but yeah, I, so one of my mates worked at the Commonwealth Bank, so he got me an interview, and then the rest was history there. But yeah, I just I like I've I've always been a bit of a numbers nerd. Like I love loved maths and problem solving was my favourite part of maths at school. And that was the only subject I did well in. A little bit of PE as well, but yeah, it's always been good with numbers. And it's just a, a genetic thing as well because my dad is good with numbers, and my two sons are as well. Like yeah, they're like freaks at numbers and nothing it's not not complicated maths i'm no good at that like i didn't do the hardest math subjects at school but just basic addition and multiplication i'm just um yeah find it very easy and so do so do my two boys so it's a bit weird how things are like that but just the way it is it doesn't part doesn't uh, my daughter didn't get that unfortunately so not as natural to her um but yeah, I just so liked doing that. But then when I was at the bank, I saw people who, because I've worked my way up into business banking. So I was there for two and a half years, but still doing landscaping on the weekends. But I um, worked my way up into business banking and I saw people coming in who had no idea what they were doing and they were making some decent money. So I thought I could do it again, do it properly and have an actual goal of working on high-end projects, not just taking on any job that came along. So that's what I did. Uh, so yeah, 2009 to 2000. And- no, sorry, 2012 to 2015, I was part-time landscaping and had some pretty um, understanding clients during that time too because uh, I could only work on a few a few days a week. Um, and, yeah, and they were pretty cool with that. So I'd work there on Saturdays and Sundays and one day during the week. And a follow-up question from Jake is, do you think landscapers should be recognised trade and why? Uh, but it is in Victoria anyway, so there's the uh, structural landscaping license. Um, it's it's also it's sometimes still though I'd say this would be the same in other states as well. It's almost like um, a secondary trade, not within building. Uh, sorry, not within not not within building, but there's building and then there's like we're the same as plasterers and concreters and tilers and you know all grouped together with the in the sub trades, which I think that's fine. But in saying that, like landscapers do have to organise a lot more and we're probably more a bit like a builder than what a lot of those other trades are because we have to do a lot more organising as subcontractors. So, yeah, it definitely should be should be considered a trade and, and recognised as such. And it does, yeah, there's, there's things where you think it should be more um, policed specifically for landscaping, like there should be rules around landscaping. But there's so much that you do within landscaping, just be an impossible task. I wouldn't have a clue where you'd start because it's, it's so, so much gray area within landscaping, what you can do and when you need to be licensed and when you don't, and it's different for each state. So it's uh, pretty like when, if you, if you ever come across someone who doesn't know something about the legalities of landscaping, you should be quite understanding because there's so much to know, let alone all the pool fencing regulations as well. So it's fast. It's yeah, interesting when you look back on, the knowledge that you learn after being in the industry for a while because all of the different things that, that you need to know just to be a landscaper. All right. Now, Project Landscapers said, what do you think social media has done for the landscaping industry? I think it's been awesome for it. Certainly for me, it has. Like, the amount of relationships I've made with people through Instagram. Like, for example, like I mentioned before, I went out for dinner the other night with Clint. It's basically just a guy I met on the internet. So, um yeah, because I so I just started listening to his podcast and yeah, send him a message every now and then, you know, comment on a post. I've done that with uh, Joel Keane from Aqu- Aqua Dreams as well. Don't think we've actually worked on a project yet. 
But, um, but yeah, there's people who I have started a relationship with on Instagram and then we've worked on projects together, certainly designers. Um, there'll be, I reckon, I'd be surprised if there's not, you know, at least 30 or 40 people who come up to me at the garden show who I will have spoken to on Instagram. So, and, and it's also good for increasing people's skills. So, excuse me, you, um, you see someone, the way someone's done something and you either work out how to do it yourself from seeing that. So it's a different technique or whatever, or you could, um, you could ask them how they do it. So there's been plenty of people who have asked me how I do things and I've asked other people how they do things. So you learn a lot by seeing different techniques and different finished products. You can see a different stone. So the first time I saw uh, Travertine Crazy Paving was on Instagram. Um, so yeah, I think it's been awesome for it. And you know, there's people who bang on about how bad all social media is, but the perfect example of the meaning behind uh, my show garden which at the garden show, which is called Mindset, if you focus on the negative things, that's what you're going to see. And if you focus on the positive things, then you'll see that there's a lot more positive things than negative things. So, yeah, that comes down to just being a good person as well. So if everyone was doing that, if everyone was a good person on Instagram, then it'd be a lot better place. Uh, beyond landscapes, I don't think oh, I've got another question coming up from you in a sec, but uh, how did you target the higher end projects? Did you feel any guilt for turning down the smaller jobs? So the way I did it was I wanted to work for certain design, like the top designers, or who I consider were the top designers. Uh, so a lot of them were based in Melbourne. Um, don't know if there's any of the down Geelong that I've done. So yeah, so they're all Melbourne based. Um, so I wanted to get my face in front of everyone and make just basically let everyone know that I exist. So the because how does how's anyone going to send you work if they don't know that you exist? So that's when I look to do things like the garden show and the block, and just um, trying to angle. I went to a lot of landscape Victoria meetings as well, which I I'm, I'm not a big um, talker or people person. Like I don't like going to events like that and um, making contacts and marketing and that sort of sort of thing, making small talk with people. Um, but I did it for that specific reason so that people wouldn't wouldn't know who I was. Um, and when it started happening, it was pretty awesome because I never really had much of a plan or anything in life. So, But I did have a plan for that and it worked how I wanted it to. So people knew that I existed. So if they get a job in Geelong, I think, oh, yeah, we know installs down there. So then... Then when you get the job, you have to do a good job of it so that you get more of it and then you, you can post about that job as well. Um, I don't feel bad about taking turning down small jobs because um, most of the time it was because we were too busy with the bigger ones and the, and the people who, who got smaller jobs didn't want to wait as long as they'd have to for, to get us to do it. And there, there weren't any that I was – I didn't really turn any down. I don't think – it wasn't that specific about the type of jobs I took on but I would just post about the big ones so because you um, become known for what you do, basically. So if you don't want to do any red brick flexible paving, don't post any about it on your social media. And I'm not saying specifically for you, but in general, if you don't want to, if there's a type of work that you do sometimes you don't want to do more of, there's no point posting about it because if someone sees that you do it, then they'll ask you to do more of it. Whereas if there's something pretty cool that you do, post about that and then that's what people will know you for. So I'll just scroll up again. Um, oh, Outdoor Oasis Landscape said, how big is the team that works for you? Full-time, casual, or subcontractors? So at the moment, it's just myself and two qualified landscapers. And it's it's a dream working with that team because um, basically we don't need to say anything about what we're doing. Everyone just knows what need, needs to get done because everyone's been with me since they were apprentices. So... Yeah, you know, to combine experience of maybe 13 years. So it's pretty cool, but um, I would put on a an apprentice if one came along who was worth worthwhile. Um, because so, I think, yeah, it'd be because it, I'm not, I'd prefer not to be on site as much as much as I love doing it. I need to be sort of half and half because I need to get the design and business side of things ticking over. So probably three days a week on site would be ideal and two in the office. 
but we don't use any subcontractors or casual. Part of it is because I don't like I don't know of any subcontractors who chop and change between landscapers, but I don't want to have any casual ones on because I f- would feel too bad about you know sending them home or not giving them hours. I'd want them to give as much as possible, so I'd rather just be on either either full time or not at all. Um, so I don't feel bad. Like if someone said that you know I could do two days a week because of family reasons or whatever, then that's something I certainly would consider. Um, but yeah, that works well for me. Like there's still time. There's times when that's too many people, and there's times when it's not enough. Like particularly during a concrete pour, so. It's not a black and white answer of it's three is the right number on ev- in every situation. So it depends what you're doing, who the people are. But um, but yeah, that is the answer to that one. It looks like it's like the uh, landscapers crew's questions are going in a different section. Is never in Dayton has said, "What do you enjoy about landscaping the most?" Yeah, that is a tough question. It's, it's almost all of it. Uh, the most would probably be the hardscaping. I love paving, I think, the most. Um, I used to like building decks more than I do now because, I mean, I still like doing them, but I did always used to laugh at carpenters when they said they were working hard after I started building a few decks because it's certainly pretty easy building a deck physically. So if you know any carpenters who think that they would work hard, just to get it to be a landscaper for a few weeks and... And see, then they can see what hard work is like. But then, in saying that, we do concreting as well, and that is that is some hard work, especially when it's getting away from you. Um, but yeah, so I love the in terms of the actual work that you do. I love paving, love the hardscaping, um, and that's probably evident in what my show garden will look like. There's a fair bit of paving in there, um, but also just the industry in general. It's, it's awesome. Like so many great people in there. It, everyone's really supportive just yeah it's just the best and I, I don't seem to see that in other industries obviously i'm not in one but but yeah the bank wasn't like that we didn't we didn't hang out with nab or westpac or anything like that when we were working there good people i was working with there's some awesome people there but um but yeah it seems like your competitors are just as likely to help you out so there's not really any competition so yeah i would say the hardscaping particularly paving yeah. And I'm starting to like concreting as well. So I like to do some floating steps. I'll be doing some of them at my place and doing a letterbox in it. Um, but yeah, that would be it. And then Lloyd's got another question. Just want to see if it's one at the top or the bottom. Would you encourage younger landscapers to subby or start quoting and learning the business game? It's a pretty it's a tough one because there's never a... So when I was talking to a few people, a couple of landscapers I knew, about you know whether I should go out on my own and start a business. So this was back in two thousand and eight or nine. Um, one of them said, "Like I love hearing these phrases that you never forget." And one of these is from a landscaper who was helping me out, and he said, um, "There's never the right time to start a business. So if you ca- if you're waiting for the perfect time, it's not going to happen because yeah, you know, it doesn't exist. There's always going to be challenges. Uh, you're always going to make mistakes and learn from them." It doesn't matter how experienced you are. It's like uh, when I put on a new employee, I'll get them paving you know, in the first week if if we're doing paving because they could watch me do it for three years and still not know how to do it. That's not because I'm a bad paver. That's just because you, know, you need to do things to, to learn how to do it, and that, that's the best way to learn. It's good if you can learn from other people's mistakes, but the best way to learn, like the, the strongest way to learn is by making the mistakes yourself so then you won't make it again especially if there's a pain involved with it. So, yeah, I, I haven't I haven't done any subby work myself, so I can't speak to what that is like. But it would be a good thing to do in terms of uh, broadening your skills. Because you're going to de- if you've only if you've started as an apprentice with one company and then uh, got qualified, and then you're going to go out on your own. You've only seen that one way to do things. Whereas if you work as a as a subby for you know, twelve months working for three or four different landscaping companies you're going to learn a lot more ways of doing things because there's so many, there's not one way to do things uh, within landscaping a lot of the time. Like there's different ways of paving and building a deck. Like some people use uh, timber posts. Some people use concrete posts. I use galvanized brackets. So 
there's just three different ways to do a deck. And there's certainly a lot more things within landscaping than just doing decks. So yeah, I reckon it'd be helpful to to work work as a subby and be patient before you start your own business. But I can understand the the keenness for people to start. So you could maybe maybe even try and do a bit of both. You could start your own business and then see if you can also work for other landscapers at the same time. So just book in their project as if you would if it was, as if it was your own project. So you could say, you know, I've got my own paving job. It's going to be three weeks. And then I can go and work with this other landscaper for two weeks or whatever, whatever you organize. So, um, so yeah, probably doing subcontracting is going to broaden your, your skills. And you can even, because like a lot of apprentices and employers don't ask much about business because they don't think about it until they want to start their own. And then they'll, once you think of starting your own, you want to start it straight away. So if you could go and work for other people as well, you could ask them business questions and learn how they do business things. So they might have a different accounting package or might use a business coach or whatever. So there's, yeah. So the more I talk about it, the more I think it's a good idea if you can do some subcontracting. Another another great question from Lloyd there. Uh, Big Ones has said, any tip for a landscape designer student with years of experience in maintenance to get started in the industry? Um, let's see. Yeah. Probably if you could do, it depends what stage you're at as a student. So if you've got, it depends what work your skills are because if you've got skills and you can do design but you just haven't got a lot of experience in doing it like if you know how to draw a design which i imagine a lot of you learn that pretty early in the in the courses you could just reach out to the landscape uh, landscape companies who do design and see if there's any like you could do work experience or something like that like i would probably have on a um if someone reached out to me i'd probably i've got a lot of designs to get through so i'd be happy to uh, have someone on to do a bit of freelance freelance work because um, yeah drawing it up is the the hardest part they coming up the ideas relatively easy and natural but uh, and again going back to lloyd's question if you you could work for a couple you could do a bit of freelance work while you're studying and then then you're going to build relationships you build contacts with other with landscape designers so, and then you might say, yeah, I like working for this company, didn't like this one so much. So you could go and work for work for that one full-time once, you, once you're ready. Um, having the experience in maintenance is going to be good because it, you should, I assume you'll have a bit of plant knowledge. So that's a that's a bonus because some some landscape architects don't have that because they don't learn it when they're when they're studying. Um, I'm pretty lucky we've got a landscape architect she's got good plant knowledge and then looking to expand it but um, but yeah I think that's a good way to do it um, I haven't, I'm not as experienced in the design side of things as we are construction so I haven't experienced that myself but that's that's what I would do if I was studying is I would reach out to landscaping companies and see if you can like if you not like if you can't do the job at least if you can you know go along to the the appointment to do the consultation and and then yeah, just get try and get involved in the in the design process because that's gonna take again what you're being taught might be different to the way a certain company does it. So that's gonna broaden your skills in that regard. Uh, Anthony has asked, which software do you make the three D? So I don't do this. We don't do the three D ourselves. We're going to be doing a little bit of using Vectorworks, but I get um, either Hannah Digital Design to do it or Pang and Landscape. So they're both a couple of um, subcontractors who do 3D design. So you send them a 2D design and some photos and measurements and they'll convert it to 3D, which is pretty cool. It's like some of it looks awesome. And it makes such, it's such a, it makes such a difference on the presentation of the design as well. So the actual design doesn't change at all, but the way that it is for the client to receive it makes such a great impact on the initial, um, the wow factor. Uh, very Clint has asked another question. Do you worry about Clint Adams coming after the top spot? So again, he's the full landscape host. And I also mentioned before that he's uh, very entrepreneurial. So he's he's also got shiny object syndrome. So he's focused on producing more podcasts at the moment, but there'll be something else that'll take his attention soon. So I'm not worried about that at all. Uh, Plant Pete has said, what attention do you pay to soil conditioning? Uh, not enough would be the the short answer but we don't when i when i was starting the business actually i was speaking to my accountant who i think he was probably in his 80s at the time 
but he's a very wise man. He was telling me I should be doing soil tests and working out the pH and giving a decline a plan to improve their soil. He said that was one of the most important things to start with, but we'd never done that when I was an employee, so I'm probably not going to do that, but thank you for the advice. But that's something that would be a good thing to do, um, to be proactive about it. But what we, like we use uh, a pretty good organic mixed soil for our, for our garden blend. And we also use a compost mulch on top. So when that breaks down, that feeds the soil. So we don't do a lot, um, but but we do generic stuff. So not nothing, but we don't we don't spend enough time on it. But in saying that, also get some pretty good results from what we do. So yeah, it's either going okay, but it's something. Yeah, it's probably an underrated thing within the industry is looking up is looking into the soil and how to improve it. We're pretty lucky where we are because so, there's some good nutrients in that. But I know in Western Australia they have a lot more issues with it because they have to they, so they have to do a lot more work on the soil and add to it because it's all sandy. Um, we're doing a job in Point Lonsdale at the moment where it's all sandy there. It's pretty nice for digging, but that's about it. So, that, yeah, we have to dig out pretty deep. Uh, so big ones it's added to his question here saying, uh, for 3D, some use SketchUp, but Vectorworks can now do everything, fly through site model, et cetera, worth every cent. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because uh, the my, the landscape architect I recently put on, she was using Vectorworks with her previous employer, but it was an older version, and I've got the 2023 version, and she was saying how much different it is now, so they've just improved it, uh, the recent model, and she said was saying how much easier it is to do the 3D for it. So we're going to be doing some, um, I don't know what the word is, but some sort of use of the, feature of the design so it might be like an alfresco area we'll do a bit a little bit of that in 3d start to do that um, and then if we if the client wants the whole thing done in 3d with the fly through then we'll get that done from a subcontract but um if you've got to be able to justify the price of for the time it takes to do the 3d so a lot of clients don't want to pay for it because it's just yeah an extra expense that they don't really need because like i said it doesn't change the design it just makes it look prettier uh, Ainsley has said sprayers or drip irrigation. So I like sprayers in a, there's probably the cons for both. I like sprayers a little bit because they, they, um, you know, make the garden look a bit nicer when they, when they've recently sprayed, so it wets the foliage down. So it's good for cooling plants down on hot days, but they're limited in terms of where they can go and they get, they're not good on curves or little short areas. So I'm definitely, would do drip irrigation if given the choice because you can go anywhere you want really. Uh, you can't see if it's not working, so that's not not a good thing about it. And they can potentially get blocked with roots and get stuck down there. But um, yeah, I would say drip irrigation. I don't know about the benefits of one or the other in terms of what's better for the plants, if anything. But I know drip irrigation is a lot less uh, locked. A lot less of it gets evaporated because it's obviously already under the mulch and if you're doing sprays it's got to saturate the mulch before it can get to the soil so you've got to use a hell of a lot more water if you're doing sprays but uh, so yeah i would be team drip irrigation uh, beyond landscapes said what's your favorite natural stone to work with well i've been doing a bit of the uh, travertine from granite works for the garden show and i love working with that it's really nice to cut um and it looks awesome as well so it's really yeah really easy to work with it's hard enough but easy to cut um, and i like the look of the gray limestone so i'll be using that at my place um i haven't worked with it i've done, cut a few of them but um but I'll, yeah i would say travertine is the winner at the moment to work with uh bluestone is a bit too hard it doesn't never breaks where you want it to and when it chips it looks so much different whereas the um, the travertine, if it chips when you're cutting miters, for example, it's not as noticeable. So you can usually buff it out or use a resin grout to, to match in with it. But I haven't found the right color to do that for the for the bluestone. So just, Lloyd said, do you charge to quote? Do you see any issues or benefits in it? Uh, I'll go through phases where I do charge to quote. So if that's if I'm not wanting to do quotes. Um, but... I'll basically, I'm at the point now where I won't 
do a quote unless there's some sort of design done. So either we're doing the design or someone else has done it. So usually if they've gone, if they're going to that point of, or have gone to that point, then they're, there's something that you can work off easily. So the quotes don't usually take a long time if everything's there in black and white. Um, I'm just trying to think of it. There's not that many that I do the where either haven't been referred, like so we've either been referred to the client from a designer or we're doing the design ourselves. So um, I don't see a problem with it. I think more people should do it if you if you want to do it, basically, you don't need to do it because other people are, but, um, but the, you do spend, you are spending time on it. So, and then you can go back and forth a few times to, to fine tune the quote. Yeah, but, so I was charging $330 for it. And even just 110 will be enough to, to get rid of the tire kickers. But, and you'd want to send it. So I've done that before with designs, for example, like I'll only, I'll send an invoice before we start the design because some people, change their mind and you could do the start on the design and then you don't hear from them. So the same can be with the quote. They might get you out to do a quote and then for some reason when you're talking to them, there's something there, they change their mind. Like that happens to everyone. You, you meet someone and you think, oh, nah, I don't think I want to go with this person. Uh, and it's too awkward for them to say, oh, nah, don't bother quoting because I don't like you. So they would just not do anything. So at least if you're, at least if you've been, paid for it it's not as big a deal so yeah i think it's a good idea to charge for quotes but um it depends and you don't it's just because you start charging it doesn't mean you would charge every job for a quote so if you're getting referrals from designers or or it's a particular project that you want to do you don't have to charge for it or it's if it's other ones if it, like the ones i was charging for were people who call up saying oh, i got your name i saw your name from uh, google blah 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 so they're like a cold lead basically so they're more likely to be a time waster or not not get, they're going to get multiple quotes. So if you are going to start charging quotes, they're the ones I would start charging for. Uh, the planted space says, not a landscaping related question, but what's your marathon PV? I, I, I promise I didn't ask this question, but um, so if you're talking the Murray Marathon, which is a kayaking marathon, did that one in 38 hours and 41 minutes. So that's 401 kilometers over five days. And I've done two running marathons. One of them, I did the Great Ocean Road Marathon when they just started that. That's how long ago it was. I think it was 2005 or six. So that's a 45 kilometer one, but they time, they give you a time at the 42 kilometer mark. So I got through the 42 Ks in three hours, 26. But then I was blown by that stage. So I did the 45 in three hours and 45. So it took me 19 minutes to do the last three Ks. So that's over six minutes per K and it was under five minutes per K for the first 42. But then I did the Melbourne Marathon and I hurt my knee in the lead up to it. So, cause I wanted to do that because you finished with a lap of the MZG. But so when you're doing a marathon, you, uh, they talk about hitting a wall. So everything's going well and how you expected it until a certain point and then you start to struggle from that point onwards for the rest of the race. So in the Great Ocean Road one, I did that. I hit the wall like 32 Ks, I think. So that's why I did such a good time with that. So at the at the start of that race, I was running with um, a group of Kenyans at the start. So I was in the, the lead group for the first two Ks, I think. And then I realized I was running way too fast. And I shouldn't be with these guys. So I slowed down. But I think I was doing like four minute, well, yeah, less than four minute Ks to start with. So I was, I was certainly not did not belong in that group. But then um, with the Melbourne Marathon, I hit the hit the wall like 11 Ks. So that's what, that was a long race. Going. And I did that. I think I did it like four hours and one minute or something. Like I wanted to, I, I knew I was I could was getting close to being able to crack four hours, but I was cramping as well. So yeah, it wasn't, wasn't fun that one. So I've only done the two and that's all I'll ever do. Uh, Michael has got a question. What do you think is the ideal crew size, cost-effective and productive? So ideal for efficiency and cost-effectiveness is one person. It's just yourself. Um, but productivity will depend on what job you're doing. So if you're doing conch rating, you probably want at least four guys, guys or girls. And, yeah, it's really dependent on what you're doing and who they are. 
Um, so I mentioned that I think in last week's or the week before, Rob Riddell said he has four guys on a site, uh, but in teams of two. So basically, the more people you have, the less efficient it is. Um, sometimes you need it to be like that for you know, fatigue wise, but but yeah, every time it, you add a person, it reduces the productivity percentage. And last question from Cascade Landscapes. What is one feature or design item that you want to build for the first time or a new technique to try? Well, it wasn't a good question for me to leave to last because there isn't really anything that I can think of. Because the good thing about us doing design and construction is if there is something like that, like if there's something I see on Instagram, I think, oh, that'd be pretty cool. I just design it into a project that we've got coming up. Um, and the same with doing the garden show. Like that's... Sometimes you might want to design something in a project, but it doesn't work for a particular design. But the garden show, and I can make it, I can do whatever I want in there. So, um, so there's on that, there's like the curved bench seat with the um, decking boards on their sides. That was a, that was something I wanted to do. So I've done that in there. There's the, I loved, like I was, when I first saw the design using crazy paving and steps, I, I wanted to do miter steps that I got to see in, um, oh, I forgot his name now, Will from Marvel, Tile and Stone. I'd seen him do them, so thought that'd be pretty cool to, to do them like that. Um, so, that yeah, that was pretty cool to do. Now, there's nothing that I can think of that is like the next thing that I want to do. Um, so, yeah, that was a terrible question for me to leave till the end, so I apologise for that. And I'll see if something else comes to me. No, nah. no. Nah, the only thing I'm going to be doing with designs is supporting. So, like in terms of design items, is supporting the uh, sponsors who are looking after us for the garden show. So, because I appreciate the amount of money that they're putting into our, like, provided for free for, or discounted for our garden. So, I'm wanting to use them as a as a priority for designs going forward. And so, I won't always use them because of. If I think a different product is the right one to use, I'll use a different product. But um, but they have some. We're using good suppliers, so I'll be looking to do that uh, going forward. Uh, and there's a lot of different ones that we're using, so it's not like it's going to be obvious or anything like that. But but yeah, that'll be that's the end of end of this one. So had some good questions there. About fifteen and an additional five or six uh, works out perfectly. Went a bit longer than normal, but yeah. I'll be looking forward to doing it again next week. So I'll put the question box up during the week and then we'll see you back here again on Sunday at 8.30. Uh, tomorrow's, oh, speaking of sponsors, tomorrow's podcast is Adam G from Anson Architectural. So he works as a salesman for Anson now and he is a qualified landscaper as well. So he started landscaping before he went into sales there. So his episode will be coming out tomorrow, which is the 27th of Feb. So February's almost over, which is wild. But uh, thank you very much for tuning in and thanks everyone for submitting the questions again. Really, really appreciate it.